big. That would be a wheat crop. We don't grow much bigger. Now that is what we call a sailor's choice. And uh, it's sort of a grunt family. They don't grow much bigger. And the one of the best baits, you want to catch a gray snapper. We'll take one of those grunts, hook it through the back, and toss it over wood, and most of the time you'll catch a gray snapper with it. You'll notice that um, I've left a piece of net out. Even when you get high winds, rough weather, it, it's pretty safe up in here to sell school the fish and leave your net. Or leave the fish what we call penned up in the net and come back and pick it up later. This bay is actually loaded with small fry at the moment. And that's what you see the mackerel feeding on. A certain way that I put the net in there so that the leads will come out first before the corks. I normally spread them out about a couple of hundred feet apart. But I've put them reasonably close, so if I have to go pick them up in a hurry, bring them in before the hurricane comes, they're easy to load aboard the boat. This here is some of the small fry. I'm going to put it in the cooler. There is some bait already in there I caught earlier on today. smell fishy. I said, wow, I am a fisherman, you know. All the way to Baylor's Bay, fish and taters every single day. They used to sing and dance as they went along. Singing a happy, but a teasing kind of song. Ah oh, ha ha, yeah man. My name is Llewellyn Hollis. I've come up in Spanish Point area. This little area is called Boss's Cove, and it's been an area for fishermen over the last hundred or so years, or even more. And uh, the tradition is still carrying on in the bay with the modern boats we've got today. The boats that used to be in this bay, when I was coming along, most of them didn't have engines. They were all sealed fishing vessels. Most of the boats in this bay today is now fiberglass boats. My boat is about the only wooden boat left in this bay. Today with the technology and the type of equipment, the boats are lighter, faster, and everybody's gone to new fiberglass boats. A friend of mine, which was a shipwright named uh, Tony Sewers, which I called him Uncle Tony because his family and my family was that close. And he said to me, you like a boat so much and you like to go out in any kind of weather, I think we should build a boat that can withstand any kind of weather. Well, at the time, there was a gentleman that had started a boat and he took sick and he wanted to sell the frame and the materials. So I bought all the materials he had. So we got it down here eventually and we reconstructed it by laying a new keel. Uncle Tony worked on the boatyard, and he would come up and give me some instructions to help me as much as he could. 
And I was saying, it's taken me a long time. Everybody else's boat's further than to my boat. He said, yeah, but we keep going. We're going to pass everybody else. Sure enough, there's two other boats being constructed in the neighborhood at the time. And that boat was in the water before they were in the water. That doesn't go anywhere anymore. And few people are interested in buying it, restoring it, but I just might keep it as something that kids can come and go aboard and see how it's built. It has what we call natural cedar knees in it that came from off cedar trees. Tony would go up in the hills and look for a natural grown cedar knee off a cedar tree. And that's what gives it strength. So it has a lot of natural Bermuda history to it and I'd like to preserve it. And I've been offered some help to preserve it, and it has brought many people home. As a child, you think you just drop a line over and catch a fish. But studying with Mr. Hollis, I realized there was much more to the trade than meets the eye. I'm Kishanda Curtis and I live in Devonshire and I'm 26. The Folklife Apprenticeship Program was put on by the Department of Cultural Affairs and it was a means by which young apprentices can partner with tradition bearers and learn a trade. And the trade I learned was fishing. Mr. Hollis was my tradition bearer and he's sort of a master fisherman. He's been on the water all his life since a little boy and I looked at the opportunity as a good one and um, readily applied. I grew up camping and fishing as a child so my dad would often take me out to fish um, on weekends and that. So I've always had a passion for fishing since my childhood. I think the most um, enriching part of the experience for me was understanding what goes on on the seas. What goes on on land is accessible, whereas what goes on on the sea tends to be a bit detached. And I feel as an islander, it was important for me to have knowledge of our other territory, which is the ocean. It's a whole nother world, and I really just wanted to become more immersed in what goes on as a Bermudian rather than sort of having half knowledge of what goes on here. But of course Mr. Hollis just opened up a whole new world for me and I'm grateful for that. It's getting that time of evening. Like most of the times I tell people best time to go fishing is like late in the evening or early in the morning. The way I work, I normally work early hours in the morning, like 5 o'clock to about 10. And then I go in and I come back out in the evening. Rainbow at night, sailors delight. It's good weather tomorrow. Let's see if we're right. Don't be fooled by thinking that it's an easy job. He's incredibly strong. Mr. Hollis doesn't need to work out or run or lift baits because the, the strength that it takes just to pull in nets or just to continuously tie up boats drop anchor, pull the anchor back up. I mean, it takes a lot of strength mentally and physically, and Mr. Hollis definitely has it all. I would definitely describe Mr. Hollis as a naturalist. He's very in tune with nature. He spends most of his days on the water, but as he's on the water, he's, he's taking note of the tides, he's checking the behaviors of the fish, He's keeping track of the moon phases. So it's definitely a combination of elements that have to be taken into consideration 
before even um, getting to the point of fishing. And I found that really fascinating because I myself am in a period where I'm trying to connect more with nature and this sort of fit in perfectly. Just increasing my sensitivity and awareness as to what's going on in my environment around me and how that impacts what I'm able to do and not do. And you can actually make a career of understanding nature, learning nature and becoming quite good at your trade. If you look in my album, some of those photographs have dates on them. But huge tuners in there weighing up to 70 pounds or more. And that's why I keep that album. It tells me what fish to fish for during those months and dates. So that's why most of the time I do carry a camera. And I try to keep a photograph of what year, what month what type of fish you catch, and what depth of water you catch. One of your best months for Wahoo is September. You can go out on a good day in September, you can rack up 25 or more Wahoos in a day. And they can all be sometimes reasonable size. End of September, right down to December, January, you'll catch tunas. For some reason, last weekend, Blue Waters Anglers Club had a tuna tournament which none of the fishermen could figure out why this month they want to have a tuna tournament. All the commercial guys shook their head and said, how come they? Well, they said it was their sponsor, one of their old tuna tournaments. But it's not the right time. So we could have caught more water, but we were wasted our time trying to catch tuna, which weren't there. <laughs> We did do a fishing tournament. That was a few weeks ago and it was really fun. We ran out at the crack of dawn and of course we saw the sun rise from the east. I didn't know what to expect and I was actually able to see how Mr. Hollis puts all his tricks of the trade to use. We were on his son-in-law's boat so Mr. Hollis didn't have his usual fish finding equipment and dap sounders. So he really used his God-given talents to help us be successful as to where to fish and which were the best spots. You have to be so in tune with nature, you have to be so patient, you know, every day is not going to be the jackpot. So you have to learn to settle with the universe and trust what you're given at any given time. So. He'll spend hours just looking for a spot that has thick bait. And I remember being quite frustrated, like, okay, can we catch something now? And he insists that no, things have to be just right. And you just have to be patient and listen to nature to know what to do, so. Not everybody has those qualities um, or the younger generations tend not to. I think in many aspects we're diverging away from our traditions and technology is a big part of that. And I think in the fishing industry, if you have a good balance of technology and sort of mindfulness to nature, then you can be quite successful. But who has the time to study their shark oil, check the tides, keep track of the moon phases? Really, who has time for that? But again, technology frequently malfunctions. I thought it like once in a blue moon, maybe your fish finder wouldn't work, but often technology fails. And if you want to be good, I think at any sort of traditional skill, you have to start from the, your traditional base before you can sort of evolve and incorporate technology and that sort of thing. And I found that even the guys with the bigger boats, they still need a Mr. Hollis. Horrible looking thing in this bottle happens to be a half of a shark's liver, which is pretty hard to come by nowadays. One time they were plentiful. It's a liver from uh, what we call a dusky shark, a shark that most people 
also eat as well as we get the oil from it to make the barometers. Normally what I do, I use stockings to uh, strain the actual shark oil into a container, which any little bits will stay in the piece of stocking I've got here. I'm going to, a little bit at a time, let it drip down into the lower container until it's full. And you can see how clear it gets as I drip it. And that's what I normally do, drip it into another container. I normally take and cap it or seal it. It's in a beautiful shape because it was taken at the right phase of the moon. And it means a lot when you get a shark's liver, make sure that it's on the oncoming phase of the moon, not on the dark side. Because if you take and get that oil on the dark side of the moon, it's not gonna be clear oil. It's gonna be the color of this. Most people say that the moon phase means a, a, a big difference because the color of the liver will actually change on the dark side of the moon. The liver will be dark. And when you catch it on the bright side of the moon, the liver is beautifully white, which that liver was actually white before I put it out in the sun. And the size of the shark makes a difference. If you get a big tiger shark rather than a dusky shark, the oil will always be dark. And the best months is August getting into September for your good shark livers. And it has to be a dusky shark. Once we get it like this, you can leave it capped and then you can transfer it into any kind of little bottle. What I do, I transfer these either into little cigar tubes or test tubes, and I fasten them onto a piece of cedar. And some of them have little shells and pearls attached to them to attract the tourists. Some of them have paintings on them. But what you'll find on any shark oil barometer that's mounted on a piece of wood that's made by me, on the back of it, to make sure that it's authentic and it's from Lou Hollis, you'll find a date and my initial on the back. And I do a little printout that states all about the shark oil, what it is and what it does, and like what local fishermen use them for. Local fishermen use the shark oil to make their barometers, which we call a weather barometer. Reading the barometer is very simple. When the oil is clear, so the weather will also be clear. When the oil is cloudy, peaks, that form inside the test tube are signs of high winds and maybe rain. So if it's cloudy and high peaks, it means rain. Now, if you're gonna get a hurricane, this oil right from the center will spiral like a twister and indicate that you're gonna get a hurricane. Each shark oil barometer, most of the time, are not gonna read the same unless it comes from the same liver same moon phase and the same shark, you're not going to get them to read the same. Mr. Hollis actually gave me my own shark oil barometer and um, I found the whole process interesting with the shark oils as well because it'll be cloudy out, yet my shark oil would be clear and I'm saying, well, Mr. Hollis, it's not working. But they tend to read at least six to 12 hours in advance. So of course, if it is cloudy and my shark oil is completely clear, in the next few hours, things tend to clear up and usually it doesn't prove me wrong, so. And the way we do it, these are little hex bottles, which makes it more easier to read because on the left, you've got a hex on the front and on the side. So if the wind directions come from that side, it will peak on that side. And if you're gonna get uh, storm right up the center you'll get the twister. It would give you a day's warning at least and it all depends how fast and how far away that is developing it makes a difference. If we're way out in the middle of the Atlantic like nobody else and it's, it's we have to rely on, on things like that. 
Now they've got the satellites, and that's why they can give you a long range reading on there is a hurricane before I can give it to you. They can tell you when they're that far off, you can prepare a lot quicker for them. The shark world will only tell you when the hurricane is almost up on you. And you better pay attention because that happens so fast that it doesn't give you much time to get ready for a hurricane. September is the worst month for hurricanes. Bermudans have to be very, very careful when you start to approach September. And most fishermen can tell you, we take our lobster traps out on most Septembers, we have to bring them back in, in safe water, and take them back out again, because that's when we look for it, the hurricane. I've been in many bad weather situations. We get some of these guys that have been with me and experienced being out in like 60 to 80 mile an hour squalls. The squall came out from up west. Lucky enough, we had someone call us, knew that we was out fishing down north. And I said, you know, yeah, look at that big squall coming. I said, it's not gonna be long before it's here. I said, we better call the guy in the next boat, which was smaller. Mine's 35 feet and built for rough weather. And he's got a little inboard outboard, which is something like maybe 22 feet. And Harbor Radio didn't know any bulletins, know anything about it. And he had his son with him. I said, call him and tell him, get out of here quick, because he's fast. And he made it inside of what they call the Western Blue Cut, which is inside the breaker line. We managed to get the tuna in the boat within seconds, get our anchor up, and it blew so hard that I told the two guys that were below, I stayed on the flying bridge to go put the life jackets on, stay in the cabin and don't come out, and I would stay up on the bridge. Well, my boat rode one huge swell from outside the reef line, inside the reef line, and it was scary. But you get these freak storms, and if you got a boat that can deal with them and you don't take any chances, you don't have to worry. But that boat was built extra strong. I used to have a scanner of wood and I used to pick up messages from Harbor Radio when somebody got in trouble. So it's had to go out in many nights. I've lost some of my best friends at sea when I couldn't do anything about it. And I always made up my mind that whenever I can help somebody that's in trouble or distress, I will go because the critical time is to get at them as soon as possible. Especially if it's the lights going, or at night you need the spotlights and equipment that, to work with. I know how to get around out in that reef in the dark. I tell guys all the time, be aware of your equipment understand your equipment. A faulty compass will get you lost. Somebody can be sitting next to the compass with a watch on and cause it to swing the wrong way and you think you're going home, you're going in an opposite direction. Anything magnetic will make the compass go berserk. So these are little things you have to know your equipment. Today I advise anybody that's got a boat do not just rely on an automatic pump also have what they call a bilge alarm, and that alarm will let you know if your water level in your boat is coming high. Because I've seen the time, people have lost boats because somebody aboard the boat as a smoker drop a matchstick down and the matchstick get in the bilge pump, stops it from working, blow the fuses, and you're relying on an automatic bilge pump, which don't work. And these are the things I try to tell people. One of the regulations that they have, if you're going offshore, the commercial fishermen all have to have a life raft. But the private sector, the ones that doesn't have the building knowledge, doesn't have to have it, which I'm always against. They need to see equipment. Commercial guys know who to call on the cell phone. If you get in trouble, one of your buddies will come pick you up a lot quicker. You've got so much new equipment, EPIRBs and radios that will float now and work under the water and GPS signals that can track you by. So all those things makes it a lot easier. But the main thing is knowing your equipment, what the boat is capable of doing, what type of weather you can go out in. So little things.
The apprenticeship took place during the winter months, so we had to kind of get right in the thick of it in the winter, which isn't your ideal fantasy fishing trip. You know, when it's cold and it's blowing and you still have to go out. But fishing isn't seasonal. Commercial fishermen has to work seven days a week. There isn't no summer break or winter break, so it's a hard job, and even more so in the winter. And because of the weather, you catch less, so you're making less money. So you really do have to budget and be mindful of how nature is going to respond to you at any given time of year or anything, really. And Mr. Hollis definitely showed me all the ins and outs. And I really enjoyed learning about the industry. And I feel like I did get first-hand knowledge on what goes on. And the average person that walks on the street, unless you know someone in the circle, you kind of don't get a true feel for what goes on, what's the good aspects, what's the not-so-good aspects. So um, it really just brought to my awareness what it actually takes to be a commercial fisherman and what it takes to utilize nature to make a living. Um, and it's not easy. Okay. So I've got the net boat, uh, which is a dinghy with a uh, hole in that in it. I normally use that for hauling mackerel jacks. And I've got a, another boat that is 23 feet, and I normally use that for pots, and I use this one for the bait. This particular engine, it's a four stroke, and it runs off a straight gas and it can pretty well run off of five gallons of fuel all day. It's pretty economical. Some of these engines, uh, uh, for a gallon of oil, something like $45. And this engine, is, it's more expensive to buy because it's a full stroke, and it's, but uh, what you save on oil in the course of a year makes up the difference. The tournament was a few weeks ago and it was good to go to this fishing tournament because you sort of saw the black fishing community come together and I had never seen that. You know, all the old fishing boats, all the old diesel boats were coming together. So then you see all the pros, they're sort of feeling the fish and it was interesting to me that for some people, they were having fun at the tournament because it was a leisure activity. But for others, this was their job. So everyone else is having fun over there. Whereas the commercial fishermen were sort of feeling, scaling, like they had to sell some fish. So it, it was just interesting to see the dichotomy of what the industry means for various people, of various means as well. We're getting so crowded with boats. There's more boats in the yards than it is in the water, but then a lot of guys can't afford to maintain them. These traps have to be in the water. September, same time as the lobster fishery starts up. You can take them out a few days prior to the start up, and you have to have an operational boat. Years ago, the way the fishery worked, if your boat was having maintenance done, you could go with any of the other fishermen in the bay to hold your traps. That's the way the old time fishermen worked. Three guys went in one boat, it cut down on the fuel costs, and for safety reasons, there's three of them in a boat. Today, if you don't have an operational boat, you can't take the traps out. <laughs> you can have a license, 
they'll pull your license if you're not operational in a certain period of time. Which to me, that's when the guy needs help, when his boat is down. He doesn't need help when his boat's operational. It's discouraging to teach the young guys to trade. A lot of guys are struggling to even pay for the fuel. And that's why I've fought over the years so they can get a fuel break because it's the younger guy that needs to help. I mean, this, this boat here, that's a $3 million boat there. That guy competes with a younger guy. You know, what young guy is going to compete with somebody who got a $3 million boat? Same thing with the mooring system. The majority of the mooring system costs 10 grand. And this is what has been happening over the years. And um, it needs to be, a lot of things need to be sorted out and changed. Hopefully it, somebody will listen one day and these are the things I try to get sorted out. Things are improving. Um, the latest legislation or the latest throne report did say that they will be working on getting um, diesel rebate for fishermen, which is an improvement. So someone's paying attention or someone is at least conscious of the struggles. But the fishing industry is quite divided based on, I would say, social class and that sort of thing. The more money you have these days, the better your equipment is, the more resources you have, the more fish you catch. If you don't have the financial resources, it's really hard to sustain yourself in the industry. Um, so I think that's probably why you don't see as many young commercial fishermen. And maybe legislation isn't as sensitive as it should be to the small commercial fishermen. But Mr. Hollis is definitely one that He's quite ferocious um, as far as being an advocate for um, the little fishermen, the little independent fishermen. Mr. Hollis is not one to deny the realities, whether they be pleasant or harsh. So he doesn't hide from controversy. If it needs to be brought to light, he'll bring it to light. And if Mr. Hollis isn't around to speak of it, I definitely will be because I have the knowledge now and I can't sort of turn my eye away from it. Sort of, I see the light, so how can I now close my eyes? Thank you, sir. And so, I do just hope I can lend my knowledge in some way to help improve the industry and to maybe advocate for more social welfare for the average commercial fisherman, to help sustain it as one of Bermuda's traditions. We do have a fisherman's room, which is down at Cooney Island, which has a lot of old artifacts that have been handed down to the fisherman's committee from fishermen's families. Like we have a whalebone down there. We have fish traps down in there, old netting and stuff, all, all sorts of stuff, old photographs of old fishermen that formed the fisherman's committee and we used to have what we call lobster bakes and fish fries up at Empty House. And it was so large that people would come from all over the islands, from St. George's to Somerset, to pick up, take out dinners, which would be either fish, lobster, or chicken. I've tried to convince some of the younger guys that we should have a function like that again. Because we used to bring all the fishermen together. And we had people that used to come in and help, like Dolly Pitcher, would come in and help to do stuffing in the lobsters, and I would cut them in half and on the half shell and clean them, and we were cooking lobsters in front of people half the time. And then, like I said, we had a, a DJ, and then we had raffles and prizes we used to give away, and it was a, a big thing. I did have the opportunity to volunteer at the National Trust, and I taught the little aspiring fishermen, which were kids um, ages 9 to 11, how to make lures. And we made them with old bits of sea rope, colorful fibers, which is what Mr. Hollis uses sometimes. And Mr. Hollis is one of the few people that actually make their own lures. And we used egg carton heads. And um, it was interesting because each kid's personality was reflected in their lure. 
and I'm sure if they were to use them in the water, different fish would be attracted to different combinations. So it was just interesting to see the kids sort of express themselves as well as learn how to make a practical tool. And what I tried to do over there was not so much promote the actual job of fishing, but to make these kids conscious of how you do need to be mindful of nature because certain colors attract certain fish at certain times of day, in certain seasons. So you really just have to be patient and um, cognizant of what's going on at any given moment in order to be successful. The other day the newspaper said I retired. I might be tired, but I'm not retired yet. <laughs> tired from where we work. <laughs> In this yard, there's a lot of history. There's a lot of things that most people don't even know what it's all about. I've worked in the shipbuilding field, and a lot of the tools that I keep around here is stuff that was a couple hundred years old. Underneath here is a Briggs and Stratton, what we call a winch, gasoline engine. This is what most fishermen use in the 70s and beyond that. And what I do sometimes, if someone's winch breaks down, I'll lend it to them for backup because it's portable, fit it on any boat. I've got one over there which came by a guy who was going to send it to the dump. I said, no, don't send it to the dump because I would like to have it and I'll restore it and show people what the fishermen used before they have some of the newer winches. That boat has never had a new engine. Any engine that's gone in that boat over the years has been an engine that I've rebuilt and put in there. The engine that's in there now still runs. I could go and start it up now, it would run. It's pretty solid still today, just that it's not the fastest. Some of the old equipment is still in there, the depth sounders, the radios still work, but I just might keep it as something that kids can come, put it back together, make it look right, and see what the new is like and what the old is like. I worked with a great man and I love to fish, so it definitely appealed to me, the fishing. Mr. Hollis isn't common, he'll always be a diamond in the rough. But I do hope that people follow his lead and incorporate all aspects of the trade because that's what makes Mr. Hollis successful holistically. Teaching younger generations about preserving the fish that we have, about how important it is to be mindful and to express best practices, you know. And I very much um, look up to Mr. Hollis for being so strong and for for not letting the hard times sort of um, deter him from what he really loves to do. I was doing a yoga apprenticeship at the same time as the fishing apprenticeship and I didn't think the two would have synergies but they definitely did. I was learning on one hand to be more mindful and to sort of listen to my body, listen to what's going on around me. And in the same breath, I was doing it with Mr. Hollis. Listening to nature, checking my shark oil, seeing how the fish are reacting, seeing how the tides are moving. So it sort of encompassed the same skill set, which surprised me. but that's what I think makes it so appealing. And hopefully younger generations will become attuned to that and maybe the interest will pick up a bit more. Because it's a great job to have. I mean, Mr. Hollis goes out on the water and there's pure silence. Given our chaotic environment we live in now, I mean, what better job?
many years ago They used to sing and dance All the way From Somerset To St. Jude They used to sing and dance As they went along Singing a happy But a teasing Kind of song What they singing man They go like All the way From Mangrove Bay That's where all the old Made stay All the way To Crowley and Cider Nothing there But foolish pride What you say man? point half a gallon and half a point all the way to Devonshire point brackish water and rotten corn man you say that's funny man they used to sing and dance as they went along yes singing a happy But a teasing kind of song Ha ha ha, yeah man <laughs> 